Thank you. Um, so I did this work at an internship at Microsoft Research with my collaborators Jane E. Martez Mott, Ed Kutrell, and Mary Morris. So people share memories using photoware, and photoware comprises a series of apps including like camera apps, photo storage, photo editing, and social media apps. And previous work shows that people with visual impairments just like everyone else want to use photoware to keep memories and share with their friends. So first I'll just go over what visual impairment is. Um, so it talk, it, visual impairment is a term that refers to a spectrum of different visual levels and types. So for example, visual impairment could in fact uh, affect the visual acuity that someone has, it might limit their visual field, impact the way they recognize colors, and might lower depth perception. And a couple of common terms we use in accessibility research are totally blind, where someone has no vision, and visually impaired, where someone has small but usable amounts of vision. Now, most previous research on photo wear and blind people has focused on people who are totally blind and they have no vision at all. And so this research um, regarding social media has focused on Facebook and Twitter use as those platforms are more popular among this demographic. And some of the key findings include that they take several photos in hopes of getting a good one, they verify photo quality with sighted people around them, and poor captions on social media make engaging with photos really difficult for this demographic. Now kind of switching gears just a little bit, teens are super users of emergent social media. For example, 75% of teens in the US have accounts on Instagram and Snapchat. However, most previous research on teens and photoware hasn't taken into account the perspectives of blind and low vision people. And since most previous work on blind people and photoware hasn't taken into account the perspectives of low vision people, we focus our study today on the perspectives of low vision people and as you'll see, they actually have some unique accessibility barriers that aren't the same as some of the key findings I shared before. So with this in mind, we developed some research questions. How do teens with visual impairments currently use photoware? What barriers do they encounter when taking, editing, and sharing photographs? And how can these practices and barriers inform more accessible photoware? And so to describe our methods a bit, we conducted interactive interviews where our participants brought their smart friends to our studies and we asked them a bunch of questions while they browsed and posted on their favorite social media for us. And so I'll go over some demographic information. We recruited 14 participants, eight were females, four males, and two were non-binary, and they had a mean age of 16.79 years. And 10 of our participants we call visually impaired or low vision in that they had small but usable amounts of vision and the primary way they accessed content on social media was by magnifying content on the screen to make it larger. So a lot of times they would zoom into content to magnify its size and then they could see it better. Our other four participants we call our blind participants and they're primarily screen reader users. So I'll share a little bit of their smartphone and social media use, just in summary. Most of our blind participants used iPhones, and actually most of our low vision participants used Android, so we thought that kind of difference was interesting. And most of our blind participants primarily used Facebook, um, which kind of reflects kind of older demographics and previous research, but most of our low vision participants primarily use Instagram and Snapchat, which is in line with some of the research on teens and photoware that I talked about before. So next I'll just go over the structure of this talk. So we've pulled out a few key findings from the paper, so more extensive information about user behavior and preferences can be found there, but we've just pulled out a few key findings in the form of challenges, and so I'll share a challenge that our participants had, followed by some recommendations we have to make these photoware more accessible. And since people with low vision have been previously underrepresented, I'm going to focus on the findings about them, but we do report about our totally blind participants in the paper. So the first challenge our participants had was with taking selfies. And in this video, you'll see a participant trying to take a selfie with her Snapchat camera. And then I can tell that there's a filter on my right. So a words just showed up on the screen and I, I saw the end of the ER. So I'll swipe back to where there's no filter. Come bring the phone closer, click the filter again and it says voice changer. So now I can back the phone up. 
So in this case, our participant couldn't see the viewfinder when her arm was extended to take the selfie, and so she had to kind of move the phone back and forth so she had all the information that Snapchat was giving her um, in order to take the selfie. And so kind of some of our recommendations for making selfie capture more accessible are allow users to pause these augmented reality prompts that are becoming more popular in selfie cameras so that they can have a chance to view them before they move off the screen. And in this case, we see that even though our participants have some usable vision, when extending their arm to take a selfie, they could benefit from some non-visual feedback, like maybe haptic or sonification feedback. So next, I'll talk about some incompatibilities our participants had between magnifying content on the screen and using their social media apps. So this video shows a participant accidentally liking a photo on Instagram. It looks nice, and I want to see more of it, and if I double tap on it like that, I'm going to like it when I didn't mean to. So this video shows that triple tap, which is the gesture to initiate a zoom in order to see the photo better, was sometimes interpreted as a double tap, which likes the photo on Instagram. And our participants would do these unintended behaviors, and they weren't really sure whether to undo the like or whether that would be perceived weird or unsocial by their friends. And so it was very frustrating to them. Another frustration was after zooming in, participants would want to swipe around the screen so that they could see all the content, but often they would swipe out of the photo, disappearing the story from their view, and so they wouldn't get to see all the contents. Another challenge was that participants couldn't actually magnify all the content on social media, and so in this uh, video, you'll see a participant wanted to see a filter better. I like this one, which is cleared on. So in this case, you see kind of inconsistent accessibility just throughout the social media apps. She wanted to edit a photo, but was unable to see kind of what the, the filter, how it would change um, the photo's contents. And so that was frustrating for our participants. So to kind of recommend some ideas for how accessibility features could work a little bit better with social media or to design unique accessibility gestures so they don't interfere and cause our participants to perform unintended actions which could be potentially socially awkward with their friends. And to make the experience more consistent, so not only should accessibility features work with magnifying like photo content, but all the content around, such as the captions, and yes, even editing photos, because our participants still wanted to edit their photos just like everyone else. So next I'll talk about a couple of different editing behaviors that we noticed among our participants. And the first one is that they edited photos according to trends they saw on social media, um, just like sighted people. And so, for example, one of our participants kind of coordinated their outfits. So I decided to spike my hair and they had studs on their jacket and they decided to wear this outfit and take a photo and filter the photo to make it more crisp, pronounced and defined because they had seen their friends posting similar photos like that on Instagram. But perhaps more of a surprising and interesting finding was that our participants also edited photos to increase their visibility. So on the slide, we have a few sample pictures because um, we wanted to protect our users' privacy. In this case, um, she was editing a selfie, but we show some non-selfie images to share how she kind of looked between filters in order to increase the photo's brightness because increasing its brightness helped her to see the faces um, or the contents in the photo better. Yet she mentioned that if the photo starts to hurt her eyes, it's actually too bright, and so she needs to decrease the brightness a little bit. So that was one dimension brightness that she kind of worked with in order to make the photo more visible to her. One participant, participant three, would actually save photos that people posted on social medias. So she would save them onto her phone and, and filter them herself so that she could see them better. So she filtered them offline, and then she could see them better and respond with captions or likes or whatever. So our recommendations include that photoware should allow users to temporarily edit photos that other people have posted in order to make them more visible to them. And this interesting finding raises research questions at the intersection of accessibility and photoware. So a lot of previous research on color visibility focuses on text and background colors, so solid colors, what's the best color text and what's the best color background for someone who's visually impaired to see. But in this case, we see that there's more research needed to understand how to increase the visibility of complex color palettes like those found in photos. 
So next, I'll talk about some challenges our participants had viewing ephemeral content. And ephemeral content is content that is only viewable to the participant for a short amount of time, and this is commonly associated with the social media called Snapchat. So the first one was a very big like kind of social versus accessibility um, challenge for our participants. So screenshotting or replaying a message on Snapchat notifies the sender, like, hey, the, the recipient just screenshotted your snap. And in the community of teenagers that we were working with, this was perceived as an invasion of privacy. Yet our participants really needed to screenshot and replay messages because they needed the extra time to see them. And so sometimes they just weren't really sure how to handle this. So one participant, 12, said, after screenshotting, I'll get annoying messages from my friends. You screenshotted it. And I'm like, yes, because you put a time limit on for your blind friend. Additionally, toggling on assistive technology in order to view snaps was time, time consuming and confusing. So one participant said, if there's a caption I'm trying to read, I'll have to triple tap, zoom in, and swipe around the screen. And often, it's, there's not enough time. However, our participants really love Snapchat and wanted to use it just like everyone else, and so they engaged a few different strategies. And so the first couple described that some participants did just replay and screenshot messages. And so one example where replay was particularly helpful was a participant said, if the content accompanying a photo is not in the middle, I'll replay and look at the top and bottom of the screen because sometimes my peripheral vision misses it. And some people just justified screenshotting. They said, well, if they're going to say anything, I have a pretty legitimate excuse. I can't see it. But some of our participants, they didn't want to screenshot or replay a message. They didn't want to deal with those social implications. And so they would just respond anyway. So if I didn't get the whole message, but I got the gist, I'll say, ha ha, or send a weird face that, based on the part I did read, makes sense. So our participants clearly wanted to use ephemeral content, and so some of our ideas to make these photo wear more accessible are to better integrate and build in assistive technology features with these apps to decrease the amount of time and complexity it takes to activate them, because time is precious when you're viewing ephemeral content. Additionally, ephemeral photo wear could detect automatically whether assistive technology is turned on, and if so, it could give these users a little bit of extra time. And also, these photo wear could allow uh, users to customize the presentation of mes messages. So for example, our user who didn't have good peripheral vision, perhaps he would want to see the caption appear on top of the photo, so it would be in the same part of the screen that is most visible to him. So the final finding I'll talk about concerns something in the literature called functional photos. So in previous literature, functional photos are defined as those that we take, these photos have information, and we take these photos to save them for later reference. So you might be in a meeting and take photos of the notes that you took during the meeting. But most of our participants took a different type of functional photo, which we introduce as personal ephemeral content. They would take photos like this restaurant menu of things in their environment that they immediately wanted to see, and then once they had the information, they wanted to delete the photo. And this was a little bit challenging for our participants because sometimes with the camera apps that they were using, it wasn't obvious how to delete photos. And some of them mentioned how they were running out of space on their phone because they took so many functional photos and didn't know how to delete them very quickly. And so our recommendation includes that cameras should have a functional photo setting for this case so participants can, or users can take a photo and quickly see it as soon as they've taken it and then be able to delete it right away as they wanted to do. So in conclusion, our teens with visual impairments, they try to use photo wear just like their friends participating in popular social media trends. Future work should focus on alleviating the challenge they have with things like taking selfies, zooming in to see content better on social media, and viewing ephemeral content. And editing, the practice of editing photos to increase their visibility presents new directions for accessibility and photoware research to better understand how to make complex color palettes more visible for people with visual impairments. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions. Um, 
Hi, Cynthia. Alessandro Soro from Queensland University of Technology. Um, I was wondering if you can say one or two words more about the motivation for um, low vision and blind people to make pictures. I, th I think you mentioned that people with low vision want to make pictures for the very same reason, like everybody else. Um, but I'm not sure. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is that yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of previous work on, like I mentioned, particularly totally blind people in photography, but I think it just, I mean, if you just think about, you know, if everybody around you is sharing photos um, or commenting on photos, it's, I, I think it's, I hope it makes sense that, you know, even if, if you can't participate in something maybe in exactly the same way, you still want to be able to participate in it just for the social um, implications and particularly for our uh, teens. It was a really interesting demographic to study because I think that's a time, maybe an age group where those social kind of fitting in is particularly important. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, I, I do think we wanted to break down that misconception a little bit in this paper by showing you know, not only do, do people with low vision and blind people want to engage with photos, but when they have some vision to do so, they want to engage visually. And so we need to address, like, not only providing non-visual feedback, but increasing the visibility um, to, to leverage the vision they do have. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Annie again. Um, I, so you talked about how sort of the ephemeral nature made consuming content challenging. Did you look at all about how when they produced the content, if they used the timing settings in any different way, or if they were adapting their sending behavior. Yes, thank you for bringing this up. This is not a key finding that we pointed out during the talk, but actually I think all of our low vision participants, you can check the paper, but most of them did not use time limits on Snapchat when they sent messages because they had that frustration and they just didn't want any of their friends to have that same frustration. As far as producing content, um, Again, the, the, Snapchat Chelsea, the Snapchat selfie camera, we saw some of the difficulties with like viewing the augmented reality prompts, but I'm not sure that there were other um, ways of producing content, you know, maybe with editing photos but that were striking. But yes, I would say this difficulty of viewing ephemeral content absolutely impacted their sending behavior and the fact that they didn't time limit their messages. 